sendiri. I want to come to Zewa Rhino Sanctuary, the only place in Uganda where you can see white rhinos in their natural habitat while working on walking on foot. So we are going to be four guides taking you for rhino trekking. We are 49. We are going to divide you into two groups. Uh, the two, me and Emma, will have to take one group. Then uh, Max, Ben and Patrick will have to take a charge of one group. So before we go to see the rhinos, always we, we believe in safety. So Max Ben is going to take us through the history part of the rhinos in Uganda. And then he, Patrick will have to take us through the safety. Okay. Then after that we shall have to go to see the rhinos. Sir. I welcome you to Zewa Rhino Sanctuary. Thank you. This is the only place in Uganda where you can be able to see southern white rhinos in the wilderness and more especially when you are footing. So briefly, in the earliest 1960s, 1950s, 1940s and below, Uganda used to have hundreds of both black and white rhinos. We had two species of rhinos, the northern white rhinos, which used to live in the Albertan regions near Makishon for National Game Park, and the eastern black rhinos, which used to live in northeastern Uganda in Kidepo Valley National Game Park. All these rhinos were heavily killed to the extinction during 1970s to 1980s wars in the country, more especially that time of President Idi Amin Dada. We had a lot of political instabilities, so people were caring for the rhinos. They took off for their own life, leaving wild animals unattended, thereby giving poachers advantages of killing our rhinos. They killed them completely to the extinction, and the extinction was declared in 1983 when the last remaining eastern black rhino was killed in Kidepokal National Game Park. After the death of that rhino, Uganda was declared a country with no rhinos. And it had to stay for over 10 years. But it was in 1997 when we gained back peace into the country. A group of concerned Ugandans who really had that love and care for the rhinos, they came back and they sat down. They started bringing ideas of bringing back the rhinos into the country. They had to form a non-government organization, which was named Rhino Fan Uganda, to support in bringing back the rhinos into the country. In 2001, Rhino Fan Uganda was helped by European Union, stakeholders of the country, they became so much successful. They went to Solo Ranch in Kenya. They picked two rhinos from Solo Ranch in Kenya. Between the two rhinos, one was a female and one was a male. And these rhinos were taken to Uganda Wildlife Education Center, currently known as Entebbe Zoo. So this was purposely to create awareness and to educate with the Ugandans and the clients abroad about the importance of the rhinos into the country. Meanwhile, when they were educating them, they were also carrying feasibility studies to know where these rhinos are going to be breeded from. Zewa Rhino Sanctuary, where we are today, was identified in 2004 as the best breeding ground for these rhinos, whereby the land, which is owned by Captain Charles Roy, was offered freely to support in the breeding program. And after the land being offered, it was fenced with electric wires covering 70 square kilometers. In 2005, in program. So a year later, that was in 2006, we were blessed to receive a donation from Disney Animal Kingdom, Orlando, Florida Zoo, United States of America, of two more rhinos, one female and one male. So they became six years at Zewa Rhino Sanctuary, and they started breeding. Surprisingly, on 24th of June, 2009, we had a bouncing baby boy 
born here at Zewa Rhino Sanction. Who later on became international baby born. The fathers coming from Kenya, the mothers coming from Orlando Zoo. So we named him Obama. So Obama became the first born baby here at Zewa Rhino Sanctuary and to the country at large since the extinction of the rhinos for over 10 years. So they never stopped breeding. They continued breeding successfully. Up to date, when we have got 34 rhinos living in Zewa Rhino Sanctuary. And that is not our main goal. Our main goal is to breed more rhinos. When they reach the number of 50 rhinos, we can pick 15 or 20 to start up a second sanctuary within a national game park <coughs> uh, for better <coughs> our generation. So however, when we shall be moving to the field, we may not be able to see all these artificial rhinos, simply because rhinos are divided, living into small social families of a mother and a baby, a group of sub-adults moving when there are two, and if you are more than lucky, to spot four. But as your guides, we are going to try our level best to take you to the best side that is going to be very possible for us. That is the historical part of our rhinos. So, in a special way, I welcome Patrick to tell you about the safety, since it is the most important point. It is all about our life. You can forget of the history, but don't forget of the safety. And also remember not to forget all. So the best is let's try to be a little bit close and attentive, because this will determine what you should do when you're in the field, for your own safety. Great. Okay, um, safety, safety, safety. What is safety? Safety is all about we living here, going to the rhinos and coming back when we are really safe. Not like the rhinos knocked any of us or in any case you have gotten injuries. So for you to achieve this, you should know that these rhinos have poor eyesight. They don't see beyond 30 meters very clearly, but they are very good at listening and very good at smelling. So when we are there, please, we shall minimize our voice to a lowest tone and not speaking at a higher tone. Are we together? Yes. Take as many photos as you can, but please, kindly, turn off your flashlights. And if you're using your phones or another device, please turn off your GPS or location. Only for this purpose, when we are done, you can fix it back. Ask as many questions as you can. We shall be there to always answer you. Any question? Yes? Why should you turn off the GPS? I will answer you okay. immediately. Why should we turn off the GPS? Now everyone knows we're here and we have taken our photos, especially when we are the rhinos. As you're taking your photos when the GPS is on, it will have to read the exact location where this rhino was. Mm. And in case you will be sharing out of excitement mm. to your friends and the others, we have ICT experts everywhere. Mm. Nowadays, wildlife crime is sophisticated. People have always gone on even online to identify exactly where they can get all this. So they may hack into that and get exactly where you've taken from. And they may think at that exact point mm. there is. And possibly they could still be there. Mm. And then you'll, after your departure from here, you leave us here with issues that maybe a rhino has maybe attempted to be killed or it has been killed. And this is one thing we always avoid. Yes. Good. Next, please turn off your, uh, put your phones in silence. In this case, don't remember, uh, don't forget, please. I kind of request you put your phones in silence for this purpose. And in the two groups, as you'll be divided, please stick to the group. Don't again remain too much of behind. Let's be together for easy control. So that whatever the, that the guide will tell you is what you'll conform to. Are we together? <coughs> in case a rhino tends to come to charge against any of us for any reason or the other, because they're always agitated by many other things like even sudden movements or any other animal around it, the best we shall do is, as a team, we shall move behind a big bush and that's all. No screaming, no panicking, no running away. The best is, the guide will give you the instruction for you, you just follow the instruction and we shall come back safely. The other alternative would be climbing the tree, going behind the tree, but of course you know, as many groups we shall be scattered here and there. If we can just move as a group behind a bush, that would be the best. Are we together? Yes. Currently we have 33 rhinos in here, but out of the 33 we may not be able to see all. 
as I said, if we see two or three, that will be enough for the day because we may need to move a lot to see many. And of which you also have the next time for the next activity. Are we together? Yeah. Great. Yes, those are white kinds. Don't worry about that. We got your question since we started. We are going to answer you after the pictures. Okay? So, in order for you to understand, what I will tell you is by keeping quiet. Okay. So, someone was asking about why are the rhinos small. They are small because they are still teenagers. They are sub-adults. Yes, please. They have not even reached that age of breeding. So they are not breeding. That is the age of for the male at the age of nine to eleven years. For the females at the age of five to six years. That is when they will start having babies. So this one now. So uh, where we are, the rhinos we are seeing is a group of sub adults, two males with one female. The female is five years old and she's pregnant for the first time and two males one has got four years another one has got three years old so meaning they are still sub adult so that group was sent away by the different mothers when they were giving birth to newborn babies and that is what always rhinos do so when the female is preparing to give birth to a newborn baby like two hours to give birth to a newborn baby she will kick away the older baby aggressively so that she creates a room for the protection of the newborn baby. Yeah. That is the first question. Second question was no, about are they white? why are they white? Why, sorry, why are they not white? In color? Why are they not white? And they are called white rhinos. So these rhinos are called white rhinos not because they look white in color. They are called white rhinos because of the wide mouth. Wide mouth. Wide. Not white. Not white. It was a misunderstanding between two people, a Dutch man and an English man. These people used to live in South Africa by then. So it so happened that uh, a Dutch man spotted uh, the species of these rhinos. So he was describing using the Dutch word, vaid. Vaid meaning wide. He was telling an Englishman that these rhinos you are seeing, they have got 
wide mouth, mm. meaning wide mouth. Mm. So an Englishman, mm. when he was writing in books, instead of writing white, he wrote white in color. Oh, thank you. So it took them time to realize that they made a mistake. Mm. And after realizing, they could not change because the old world knew that mm. we have got white rhinos. Okay. So what they did, they went and named black rhinos black just to create the opposite of white. This is a swampy area. Mm -hmm. I know the water retaining capacity of the swampy zone is very low. It has rained here uh, the other day and it was very heavy. That's why it's still here, but it will go down with time. Two, what is the gestation period of these rhinos? The gestation period of southern white rhinos in documentation or in books is always 14 to 16 months. But here in the sanctuary, we have the rangers who always track these rhinos 24 7 and they stay with the rhinos. So they help us so much to collect enough data for us to know much about these rhinos. According to the data they have collected, all our rhinos goes for 16 months, except only one that goes for 17 months of gestation period. Okay. Yes. It's not a dry, okay, if it's a dry season, do the rhinos still come this way? Is that the question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the rhinos have to come this way. And what you should... It's wet, do they like chill in the water, you know, like swim? Very good. Rhinos do not have sweat glands. Like, I'm now sweating because it's very hot. The rhinos will not do that. So the best they will have to do is to always get a shade and they rest under the shade. Or the other alternative would be getting a pool of mud and rolling themselves in it to cool down their body temperature. Like buffalo. Yes, yes, they do that. The next question was? Do you have any other animals? Do we have yeah. any other animal in the sanctuary apart from the rhinos? Yes, we have about 30 other species of mammals in here. One of them is the leopards, we have them here. We have the hippos deep into the swamp. We have uh, warthogs, like you've been seeing them. Then we have the waterbucks, we have the bushbucks, we have the pangolins, we have advac, and many others. Who are they? Well, will weigh between 2.8 to 3.6 tons. Heaviest they are, considered to be the second heaviest land mammal after an elephant but they are very fast in running. A fully matured rhino can run 45 kilometers per hour over long distance, and these are the white rhinos. But the black rhinos can run four, uh, 55 kilometers per hour over long distance. That's why in the safety I told you not to run away in yeah. case yeah. of anything. They belong in the big five? Yes. The last question from you? You are talking about safety, safety, safety. Now you reach here and you tell us the leopards. <laughs> okay, leopards are nocturnals. At this time, they'll be resting either on trees or deep into the bushes. In case we see them, of course, we shall also tell you accordingly. That's why you have you are the guides with us. We have got two rangers. Uh, the first one is called Walter, and on the other side is called Geoffrey. Hi, Walter. Hi, Walter. Hi, Walter. So, the group of the rangers that were spotted. They are mounted by uh, yeah. Walter yeah. and Geoffrey. Yeah. Their work majorly yeah. is to keep the security of these rhinos. Because right. we do not want to hear a scenario which yeah. happened in 1970s to 1980s exactly. where our rhinos were killed to the extinction to happen again. Oh. Because we introduced them uh, to breed and to release to their natural no, wildlife. I believe all of us who have smartphones take this trip to also create more awareness. It's always not about only taking the selfie and everything is okay. If in your selfie you can also just write two, three words, please, let's save the rhinos. It would be very good. Did you know that there are only 35 in the whole country? Beautiful. Three, three here yeah. and two in the zoo, only 35. We can just create more awareness. Let's live here as conservation ambassadors. Not only we have seen the rhinos, we have tracked and that's all. Please, let's leave that and we shall be the happiest. Otherwise, thank you very much for visiting us. Let's get back slowly. Thank you.
George is my name. You are right now at the top of the falls. And there are only two things you can do here. Either you can walk on Baker's Trail, which takes you to some elevated point along the river bank, and from that point, you will be able to view all the two waterfalls. First of all, it is very important for you to know that we have two waterfalls. The main one, that one making noise, is the Massison Falls, which formerly they used to call Kabalega Falls. And then the Uhuru Falls came up later on in 1962, for the first time when the Nile flooded. That was way back in 1961, and then eventually in 1962, it broke off. And uh, toward the halfway of that channel, it created for us the second waterfall. Because that coincided with the time when we got independent. Now, hole in hole, the Nile comes all the way from Jinja. This is the Nile. And then all of a sudden, at this point, the main waterfall, it drops down 45 meters deep into the gorge. It moves zigzag for some time and then continues to Lake Halbert. This is the narrowest point along the Nile, only seven meters wide. Seven meters wide. Seven meters wide. And the whole of the water from the Nile squeezes through this seven meters gap and drop down 45 meters. That's why you can get that sound. Actually, up to 300 cubic meters of water per second passes through this narrow gap. Yeah. That's why it is known to be the most powerful waterfalls in the world. So later on, um, in 1962, as I told you, because of the flooding, the amount of water became too much for this seven meters gap. And what happened when the Nile broke off? This is what happened. It comes and joins this one. And a halfway that is what we have the Uhuru Fall. My idea, Uhuru Fall is Freedom Fall. My idea is we are, we are somewhere here standing. You can either take this short trail only about 200 meters to the main fall. You will see that going. Or else, you start from Baker's Trail, which come round on the river bank, somewhere here, on an elevated point, you will be able to view both of the two waterfalls. In fact, if you put your phone horizontally, one click, you have all the two waterfalls. And how long is this? And this is between 45 minutes to one hour. Walking? Walking. Just going? Yeah. Uh, hill. Don't mind now. When we come back yeah. from where we are going to see the two waterfalls, see half there where there's rain. Yes, yes. Then we come back and slope to the main falls. Yeah, through here. Where you are going to have a shower. How all yeah. of you from the Nile? <laughs> so we are going down here. <laughs> not, not the down one, the upper one. That small highland over there is the farthest you can come by boat. So the boat stops there and goes back. You can see that from the boat, the fall is very far away. Today is your best day. So George is my name, 
I must say you are most welcome to the top of the falls. This place is where the name of the national park derived from, Massachusetts Falls National Park. And uh, because of these great waterfalls, here in this place when you come around, we only offer the views of the two waterfalls. You can either come down to the main falls, which is a short distance from the parking yard, 200 meters, or you take a walk around along the river bank to some elevated point, where to some extent you will be able to have the two views of the two waterfalls. That is the main falls, Massisun Falls, and then uh, the second one, which came up in 1962 because of the flood. That is Uhuru Falls. The name Uhuru Falls was given because it coincided with the time of independence. And uh, it is a place where most people who come to visit Massisun Falls, National Park, they don't miss. It's the central point of the safari when you're making safari to the National Park. Then from here, either you go to the National Park headquarters and you carry on with other activities like uh, game drive, which basically takes you across the Nile on the northern bank, on the savanna grassland where you see varieties of animals. And um, after that, you come back and you can also take a boat cruise, which is another activity. Three hours from the park headquarters to the falls and then back. And uh, so many activities. You can also take a nature walk around, which is designed around the hotel. You can go birding. You can uh, take a delta trip down from uh, Massisson Falls headquarters to the delta point where the Nile uh, enters into Lake Halbert and then continue its journey going north to Sudan and finally Egypt. You can as well as uh, go for night game drive. These are whole activities which you can do in Massisson Falls. So this is to name on a few, but otherwise the place is a variety of activities you can do. Back on the southern bank here, you can always go to the forest. That is uh, Budongo Park, Budongo Forest. You can, uh, they can uh, offer for you uh, simpanzi tracking. You can go for bird watching in the forest. Forest walk to see the ecotourism activities inside the forest and uh, to name it. So these are a few of the things which you can do around when you come to the park. few questions politely that don't leave our environment and don't remove any pebbles from the structure. This is under Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife Department of Monuments and Museum. Our works preserve culture and heritage. The people of Pachiko. We are the Pachiko family. That's why the place is called Pachiko. Pa means or belongs to Pachiko. Everything, everything here belongs to him because he was the one who brought people here from Sudan. When you talk of migration of Luo, when Labo and Gipi were uh, separating from uh, Pakwach, Ubungu, there's other Luo decided to go back. Some few. That's why we have the uh, Achuiro Pajok in Sudan. Those were the wounded ones that they cannot make it here. And when this man brought these people here, this was a jungle. No one was here. The hyenas, the lion, the elephants were here. They used to stay under that big hill there, behind you. 
Japan, this was constructed new by the government of Uganda. You know, we suffered 20 years of Northern Rebellion, the Kony War. The government thought it was to bring this castle remain near to the people. That's why this structure is built here. And in our culture, we don't have just kind of structures. We used to have grass stars. That's why we have our stores like those ones, the two. Those are one granary, the Dero. Now, when the people were here, we the particular people, we call ourselves Chole. But in general, we are somehow unique in the way we do our things. The way we marry, the way we eat, the way we dance, somehow is different. And also here, we the particular people, we are our own God with a small g. It's not that we are witchcraft, we are born again people. And the God of ours is called Baka. Baka is B A K A. We believe that God of ours is superior, despite the Almighty God in heaven. That is tradition. That's why when people are not, young boys are not getting married here, serious diseases are coming in. Crops are not eating well, people are not receiving enough rain. That's the time our world would say, our God is annoyed of the people, there's something wrong. You have to do something to please our God. Even during the COVID time, we're supposed to do tradition here, but the government said, no, this is science. But still, we believe that our God also participated in the COVID for us. Because that is tradition, we should not question our tradition. Secondly, in particular here, inside the palace, we have a drum with the skull of a man. Hmm? Those days, for you to become what, or a kabaka, you should have something unique about you. Either you should be very rich, or you have many women, or you have many children. That's how they come to become a what? A, a what? Or what? A kabaka. That's why that man was killed because he was disturbing our people here because of land. You know, people used to fight for a hunting ground. Young boys were organized to go and fight with a blessing from our brother. And they managed to kill him. Because the distance was far, they cannot carry the whole body to the palace. The only thing they did is to cut the head and other parts and bore it to the palace. And the Lord said, thank you. Now we have peace in, the, in, the, in our territory. Can we make a royal drum? That's why they'll put that skull inside the drum. And that is also, we believe, that they can take care of our palace with the use of the young boys with bows and arrows and spears. That's why we don't see soldiers protecting this palace. Because we believe our God is superior, can protect us. And also that drum, to the 10 values of elderly people when you're about 75 years. <coughs> and when you belong to the royal clan. The royal clan is called Kal. But we have other seven clans that comprise of this palace. And one of the one of the clan is called Puguini clan, and another one is Pachua clan. Pachua, when you know about Pachua, those people who need who read a lot of books, there's a man who wrote uh, the song of Lawino. Babita is our brother here. Yeah, and that drum to the ten bodies of elderly people when you die, like you're about 75 years, and they make it to be a public holiday for us here when they are carrying the drum to attend your burial. Because our tradition says, if it happens to meet you on the way, and you're a young woman, or you're a young man, you're going to be barren. You will not bear any baby when you run away. Because it's our tradition, and strictly only the elderly people who handle just kind of events. They have to to close your door in the morning or late in the evening when they carry the drum. We believe that our tradition works. That is why 
when these Arabs were coming in, they found that system was already there. And our people here were thrown around a fireplace in our language called one O. There's no going for a class work, formal work. The only thing, the, the old boys are supposed to gather around the fireplace at night. And you are told how to hunt, how to fight, how to marry, not to marry relatives. Young girls were taken inside the kitchen by their mothers and they were taught how to dress well, how to cook, how to choose a good husband. That's the only thing in the eight years those days. That's why it was very simple for the Arabs in 1850 when they were hunting elephants from Sudan coming this side. They landed here, they found that that system was already running. And one man was the only leader of all the people. And they were in need of ivory. They found the elephants were here. The hyenas, it was a jungle. People also were staying here with, the, with those wilds. What they did, because the people here, they were speaking in Luo, and for them, they were speaking in Arabic. What they did is to dress our world with their beads, the necklaces, and they gave the mirror our watch in terms of the ivory. That's why they put this place to become the market for ivory. When we were doing butter system of trade, and also it was a silent trade. There was no language to meet these people, and again, even there was no money. For three years, it was a normal trade. You carry your ivory, you enter from that gate, and you go and place next to what to go with. When they fail to stop you, that means you deserve that product and you come with it outside. Now, when this hybrid got scarce because the elephants started running away to the park, on the eastern direction we have Kidepo National Park, and the other side we have Maxion Falls. All this wild threat from this area to the park, because the population was increasing, that there's a market in particular. People are bringing in ivory. No more ivory, they leave away taxes to the people of this place to grow same Simoro millet. And for them, they were moving forcefully at night with their guns. Those days they were using the muskets. And for us here we were having bows and arrows and spear. That we cannot fight them. And they go at night forcefully, they brought people, put them, they were using nature under the cave, putting people to become prisoners. After in the morning, you are taken for judgment. Now from there, they were taking beautiful girls. And some boys were taken, and the strong ones were taken to Sudan, at a place called Gondokoro, Sudan, and they were using the caravan, and they were moving on foot. Again, before that, they go home, back. They go to you, and they will say, do bring same Simoro millet to bring back your, uh, your daughter or your son. The only thing they did, they were having a very big basket with some holes and they carried it up and they wanted to pour the simsim to fill up the basket. And again, the simsim would go down. And even you, you are going to be stopped not to go out. Why? All the ugly people, <coughs> the disabled ones, and the elderly ones were not allowed to come out. And all of them, they were beheaded. They were executing them, they were killing them. Others were taken to first firing school when they should using guns. They are doing this because they want to keep the information within the place so that they cannot spread the bad image of this place to other people. It, is taken, it is took them 19 years to bring all these people from this place. It led to migration of people from this side. People started running away. They cannot fight these people who have guns. Who migrated. One of our men, the road school, Roromo, decided with other people, with his children, to the eastern direction. And he was telling people that they want to see where the sun is coming from. And there are the people in our history here, are the people moving naked in Ethiopia. We are still waiting for them to come back because they are our son and daughter. Now, other people, even from here, they migrated and they gather around Amuro and they also supported the 1911 Amogi rebellion. In East Africa, we had three rebellions. 
Maji Maji and Mau Mau. And for Uganda with Bamogi in 1911, our people also supported them with that rebellion. That's why we talk of this white man, Becker. Becker himself, because of the agreement between British and Egypt, because of the law of the Sons of the Nile, in that agreement, they decided to make Becker move to explore the Sons of the Nile, to see where the Nile started from, despite the natives were around, because for me I know the natives know before they were there. But for them, they said they have discovered the Sons of the Nile. They moved from that side. That's why in Egypt, if you work in public offices, the first topic you should speak is about the River Nile. That was a long way. That's why Becker moved 1860, 1860, 1864. That's the time when Becker was the Nile from the interior. He met speak at Bondokoro. Speak, they already discovered the source of the Nile. On that way, because for them, when they were coming, they used the eastern direction. On that way, also, they found Becker was from the Nile. That's why Becker went to Bunyoro. And he was taken by Dobukama Bunyoro to see the falls. And he gave that name, Mashishon Fall. That was the name of the president of the Royal Society, who called Sir Roderick Markshon. And he went ahead to confirm Lake Albert. Because at that time, Albert was a constant of Queen Victoria. But all tribes in Uganda have different names of calling that lake. For us in Acholi, we say Namine Rubonyo. Rubonyo is a locust. We believe when locusts try to cross the lake, they will fall and die. That's the meaning. That's in our local language here. When Becca was going back, he passed through this land. He met our word called Kikuyakare. The challenge again was the language. He cannot speak with these people. But they look at these people that they were killing people here. In that year, Britain went to abolish slavery in Europe. When they talk of Benin Conference in Germany, they were talking about divide the world and rule. They were talking about slavery. That's why Becca was sent to come back. And again, with great work given to him by Egypt to become the Governor General of Equator Province in 1870. Becker accepted the work in 1871. Becker decided to move from Bulgaria, where he found a slave market, and there was a young woman, a white girl in the slave market. Because of the color, Becker bid for the lady. And he might be the of the bid, and the lady told him that, I don't know where I came from, let me go with you to Africa. And she became the second wife of Becker. She's called Barbara Florence. On this way, through Egypt, he was supported with Egyptian troops to come and fight these people with trained soldiers. Like 1,700 Egyptian troops, he passed through Sudan, he got some money, that's all the Nubians from Sudan. At noon, 1872, Beckham managed to capture this place with battle. They fought and he defeated them. He restored peace to the people of this place and he became the savior of the people here. That's why we call Beckham's fort. It's a reward for him. But it was not the one who built the structure. All these structures were constructed using mud or clay by the Arab. All the cement you put, you see, is put by Ugandan government in 1972. When they said the Gazette had become a historical monument, that's why we are here. The cement was put to preserve them, farm. Now, when Becker reached here, he stayed for four years before another man succeeded him. That was Gordon, was a canon. Because they want to capture Karatun from the Arabs, he was killed from that fight. He cannot make it back here. And we talk of another man, talk of Amy Passa, also was here. He passed through the land, he went to Wadela in West Nile. And he put a similar fort in West Nile, that side. Now, Becker stayed for four years. And again, it was the first time for the black people to see the first white woman from here. They compared the lady, very beautiful, very bright like the moon at night. And they gave the name Anyadwe, the dot of the moon. And that's me when somebody told you Anyadwe, if you're a lady, to be very happy. You are beyond beauty now. You are very beautiful. I hear this. The description. That's the description that I've given to that lady. And where we are, and where we are, it's called Anyadwe village. Anyadwe? Anyadwe village, where we are. Yeah. 
<laughs> and the bar is called Carl. Carl. Yes. Carl. And he stays here for four years. Before he left this place, that man succeeded. Now the current government, the NRF government, has also preserved the place by putting policies. One, by enforcement, putting people not to encroach to the land because of max stores, by recruiting us to work here under Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife. For me, I've worked here for eight years, after my school, and also I belong to the Royal Palace. Yes, that's why we have the story, and also for your information, the government is supporting us to write our books out, and October, mid-October, we are going to publish our book out for you people to buy, but unfortunately, the person behind the book was the people the Speaker of Parliament, he died, and even the late chief, Lord Jeremiah, died also, but we are still living. They are going to bring the book out. So, I'll write your... Some of us would have been beheaded. Hey, you! Hey, how about you? Your head up. I cannot see the blood because I've taken for long. This is granite rock, it's hard rock. It's like salmon, when rain is coming, it can wash it away, it cannot absorb the rain, uh, the, the blood. Yes. But this was the point where they were murdering people for nine years. And also we believe...
question politely that don't leave our environment and don't remove any pebbles from the structure. This is an amusement of tourism and wildlife department of monuments and museums. Our works preserve culture and heritage. The people of Patiko. We are the Patiko family. That's why the place called Patiko. Pa means or belongs to Atiko. Everything, everything here belongs to him because he was the one who brought people here from Sudan. When you talk of migration of Luo, when Labo and Gipi were uh, separating from uh, Pakwach, Ubungu, there's other Luo decided to go back. Some few. That's why we have the uh, Achuilo Pajok in Sudan. Those were the wounded ones that they cannot make it here. And when this man brought these people here, this was a jungle. No one was here. The hyenas, the lion, the elephants were here. They used to stay under that big hill there, behind you. The part, this was constructed new by the government of Uganda. You know, we suffered 20 years of Northern Rebellion, the Kony War. The government thought it was to bring this castle remain near to the people. That's why this structure is built here. And in our culture, we don't have just kind of structures. We used to have grass stars. That's why we have our stars like those ones, the two. Those are one granary, the Dero. Now, when the people were here, we the particular people, we call ourselves Acholi. But in general, we are somehow unique in the way we do our things. The way we marry, the way we eat, the way we dance, Somehow is different. And also here, we the particular people, we are our own God with a small g. It's not that we are witchcraft, we are born again people. And the God of ours is called Baka. Baka is B A K A. We believe that God of ours is superior, despite the Almighty God in heaven. That is tradition. That's why when people are not, young boys are not getting married here, serious diseases are coming in, crops are not eating well, people are not receiving enough rain. That's the time our world would say, our God is annoyed of the people, there's something wrong. You have to do something to please our God. Even during the COVID time, we're supposed to do tradition here, but the government said, no, this is science. But still, we believe that our God also participated in the COVID for us. Because that is tradition, it should not question our tradition. Secondly, in particular here, inside the palace, we have a drum with the skull of a man. Those days, for you to become what, or a kabaka, you should have something unique about you. Either you should be very rich, or you have many women, or you have many children. That's how the crony become a what? A, a what? Or what? A kabaka. That's why that man was killed, because he was disturbing our people here because of land. You know, people used to fight for a hunting ground. Young boys were organized to go and fight with a blessing from our baga and they managed to kill him. Because the distance was far, they cannot carry the whole body to the palace. The only thing they did is to cut the head and other parts and bury it to the palace. And the Lord said, thank you, now we have peace in, the, in, the, in our territory. Can we make a royal drum? That's why they put that skull inside the drum and that is also, we believe that they can take care of our palace with the use of the young boys with bows and arrows and spears. That's why we don't see soldiers protecting this palace. Because we believe our God is superior, can protect us. And also that drum, to the 10 barriers of elderly people when you are about 75 years. And when you belong to the royal clan, the royal clan is called Kal, but we have other seven clans that comprise of this palace. 
and one of the one of the clan is called Ugwini clan and another one is Pachua clan. Pachua, when you know about Pachua, those people who need who read a lot of books, there's a man who wrote uh, the song of Lawino. Babita is our brother here. Yeah. And that drum to the ten bodies of elderly people when you die, like you are about 75 years. And they make it to be a public holiday for us here. When they are carrying the drum to attend your burial. Because out of this one says, if it happens to meet you on the way, and you're a young woman, or you're a young man, you are going to be barren. You will not bear any baby when you run away. Because it's our tradition, and strictly only the elderly people who handle just kind of events. They have to you to close your door in the morning or late in the evening when they carry the drum. We believe that our tradition works. That is why when these Arabs were coming in, they found that system was already there. And our people here were thrown around a fireplace in our language called one O. There's no going for a class work, formal work. The only thing that the old boys are supposed to gather around the fireplace at night. And you are taught how to hunt, how to fight, how to marry, not to marry relatives. Young girls were taken inside the kitchen by their mothers, and they were taught how to dress well, how to cook, how to choose a good husband. That's the only thing in the eight years those days. That's why it was very simple for the Arabs in 1850, when they were hunting elephants from Sudan coming this side, they landed here, they found that that system was already running. And one man was the only leader of all the people. And they were in need of ivory. They found the elephants were here. The hyenas, it was a jungle. People also were staying here with, the, with those wilds. What they did, because the people here, they were speaking in Luo, and for them, they were speaking in Arabic. What they did is to dress our world with their beads, the necklaces, and they gave the mirror to our world in terms of the ivory. That's why they put this place to become the market for ivory. Where they were doing butter system of trade, and also it was a silent trade. <coughs> there was no language to meet these people, and again, even there was no money. For three years, it was a normal trade. You carry your ivory, you enter from that gate, and you go and place next to what to go with. When they fail to stop you, that means you deserve that product, and you come with it outside. Now, when this ivory got scarce because the elephants started running away to the park, on the eastern direction, we have Kidepo National Park, and the other side, we have Maxion Falls. All this wild threat from this area to the park because the population was increasing, that there's a market in particular. People are bringing in ivory. No more ivory, they let the way taxes to the people of this place to grow same same more millet. And for them, they were moving forcefully at night with their guns. Those days they were using the muskets. And for us here, we were having bows and arrows and spears. That we cannot fight them. And they go at night forcefully, they grow people, put them, they were using nature under the cave, putting people to become prisoners. After in the morning, you are taken for judgment. Now from there, they were taking beautiful girls. And some boys were taken, and the strong ones were taken to Sudan, at a place called Gondokoro, Sudan, and they were using the caravan, and they were moving on foot. Again, before that, they go home, back. They go to you and they will say, do bring Sim Sim or Millet to bring back your, uh, your daughter or your son. The only thing they did, they were having a very big basket with some holes and they carried it up and they wanted to pour the Sim Sim to fill up the basket. And again, the Sim Sim would go down. And even you, you are going to be stopped not to go out. Why? All the ugly people, <coughs> the disabled ones, and the elderly ones were not allowed to come out, and all of them, they were beheaded. They were executing them, they were killing them. Others were taken 
to first firing squad when they shoot using guns. They are doing this because they want to keep the information within the place so that they cannot spread the bad image of this place to other people. It is taken, it took them 19 years to bring all these people from this place. It led to migration of people from this side. People started running away. They cannot fight these people who have guns. Who migrated. One of our men, the road school, Roromo, decided with other people, with his children, to the eastern direction. And he was telling people that they want to see where the sun is coming from. And there are the people in our history here, are the people moving naked in Ethiopia. We are still waiting for them to come back because they are our son and daughter. Now, other people, and even from here, they migrated and they gathered around Amuro. And they also supported the 1911 Amogi Rebellion. In East Africa, we had three rebellions. Majimaja and Mau Mau, and for Uganda with Lamogi in 1911. Our people also supported them with that rebellion. That's why we talk of this white man, Becker. Becker himself, because of the agreement between British and Egypt, because of the law of the soul of the Nile, in that agreement, they decided to make Becker move to explore the soul of the Nile, to see where the Nile started from, Despite the natives were around, because for me I know the natives know before they were there. But for them they said they have discovered the source of the night. They moved from that side. That's why in Egypt, if you work in public offices, the first topic you should speak is about the river Nile. That was a long way. That's why Becker moved 1860, 1860, 1864. That's the time when Becker was falling the Nile from the interior. He met speak at Bondokoro, speak they already discovered the source of the night. On that way, because for them when they were coming, they used the eastern direction. On that way also they found Becca was from the night. That's where Becca went to Bunyoro. And he was taken by Dobukama Bunyoro to see the falls. And he gave that name Mashishon Fall. That was the name of the president of the Royal Society who called Sir Roderick Markshon. And he went ahead to confirm Lake Albert. Because at that time, Albert was a constant of Queen Victoria. But all tribes in Uganda have different names of calling that lake. For us in Acholi, we say it, Namine Rubonyo. Rubonyo is a locust. We believe when locusts try to cross the lake, they will fall and die. That's the meaning. That's in our local language here. When Becca was going back, he passed through this land. He met our word called Kikuyakare. The challenge again was the language. He cannot speak with these people, but they look at these people that they were killing people here. In that year, Britain wanted to abolish slavery in Europe. When they talk of Benin Conference in Germany, they were talking about divide the world and rule. They were talking about slavery. That's why Becca was sent to come back. And again, with great work given to him, by Egypt to become the governor general of Equator province in 1870. Becker accepted the work in 1871. Becker decided to move from Bulgaria, where he found a slave market, and there was a young woman, a white girl in the slave market. Because of the color, Becker bid for the lady. And imagine they went on the bid, and the lady told him that I don't know where I came from, let me go with you to Africa. And she became the second wife of Becca. She's called Barbara Florence. On this way, through Egypt, he was supported with Egyptian troops to come and fight these people with trained soldiers. Like 1,700 Egyptian troops. He passed through Sudan, he got some money, that's all the Nubians from Sudan. At noon, 1872, Becca managed to capture this place with battle. They fought and he defeated them. He restored peace to the people of this place and he became the savior of the people here. That's why we call Becker's Fort. It's a reward for him, but it was not the one who built the structures. All these structures were constructed using mud or clay by the Arabs. All the cement you put, you see, is put by Ugandan government in 1972. When they said the Gazette became historical monument, that's why we are here. 
the semen was put to preserve them, farm. Now when Becker reached here, he stayed for four years before another man succeeded him. That was Gordon, was a canon. Because they want to capture Karakum from the Arabs, he was killed from that fight. He cannot make it back here. And we talk of another man, talk of Amy Passa also was here. He passed through the land, he went to Wadela in West Nile. And he put a similar fort in West Nile, that side. Now, Becker stayed for four years. And again, it was the first time for the black people to see the first white woman from here. They compared the lady, very beautiful, very bright like the moon at night. And they gave the name Anyadwe, the dot of the moon. And that means when somebody told you Anyadwe, if you're a lady, to be very happy. You are beyond beauty now. You are very beautiful. That's the description that we given to that lady. And where we are, and where we are, it's called Anyadwe Village. Anyadwe? Anyadwe Village, where we are. Yeah. And the part is called Kal. Yes. And he stays here for four years. Before he left this place, that man succeeded. Now the current government, the NRF government, has also preserved the place by putting policies. One, by enforcement, putting people not to encroach to the land because of max stores, by recruiting us to work here under Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife. For me, I've worked here for eight years, after my school, and also I belong to the Royal Palace. Yes, that's why we have the story, and also for your information, the government is supporting us to write our books out, and October, mid-October, we are going to publish our book out for you people to buy, but unfortunately, the person behind the book was the people the Speaker of Parliament, he died, and even the late chief Lord Jeremiah died also. But we are still living, we are going to bring the book out. taken for long. This is granite rock. It's hard rock. It's like salmon. When rain is coming, it can wash it away. It cannot absorb the rain. Uh, the, the blood. Yes. But this was the point where they were murdering people for 19 years. And also we believe...